Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we're based here in the UK, all times are in GMT. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 3rd to the 9th of February. I'm Features Editor Ezzie Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Mary McIntyre. Hello, Mary. Hi, Ezzie. It's great to be back. It's great to see you. So, do we have anything fabulous coming up in this week's night sky? We certainly do. The planets are continuing to put on an amazing show. There's an asteroid moving through the sickle of Leo and an absolute array of Claire Obscure effects visible on the moon this week. Ooh, sounds fantastic. Let's get going. Okay, so the planets at the moment after sunset, Saturn, Venus, Neptune, Uranus, Jupiter and Mars are all visible. So basically all the planets except for Mercury are visible in our evening sky. Saturn is now getting lower, so make sure you observe it while we still can because in a couple of weeks time we're going to start losing it into the evening twilight. But it's currently at mag plus 0.8. It's in Aquarius and it's in our skies until about 7.45 p.m. So, yeah, make sure you get out and have a look at that and try to have a look at the rings, which are almost dead, John, at the moment. Yes. Oh, yeah, because they really do close up when we see them at this angle. But you can still see them. Just in case, we have talked about this in previous episodes, but Saturn's orbit's at a bit of an angle, so sometimes we see it when it's slightly above Earth in the plane of the solar system, and sometimes it's slightly below. And at the moment, we're seeing it almost dead on, which means the rings are pretty much facing directly at Earth. In March, they are going to appear to completely disappear. They will be back, don't worry, but it's a very interesting time to look at Saturn. It is. And the good thing about the rings being edge on is you can actually see all of Saturn. (laughs) Normally, the rings are obscuring it. So it is good to, if you've got a bigger telescope, to try to see some of those surface features. If you want a challenge on Saturday, the 8th of February, there is a daylight transit of Titan. That's taking place between 12.48 and 4.28 p.m., That is going to be really difficult unless you've got a fairly large telescope, although the gas giants can be seen in the day. Yeah, I wouldn't have even thought that was possible. So that's actually really interesting to hear. It is. And later on, when it starts to get dark, the shadow of Titan will transit. That will be a little easier to see than the planet itself. So that shadow transit starts in daylight, but continues through till 8.20 p.m. So once it gets dark, you may be able to spot the shadow of Titan on the disk of Saturn. Much easier to see is Venus, which is blazing at mag minus 4.5 at the moment. And it's very close to Neptune, which is a very contrasting mag plus 7.9. Both of them lie in Pisces. Neptune is about four and a half degrees below Venus. So you can use Venus as a pointer to try to locate Neptune with binoculars. You will need binoculars or a telescope to see it. Neptune is setting a little bit before Saturn at 8.50 p.m. Venus sets at 9.15 p.m. So we've got got plenty of time to look at Venus once it gets dark. And you will notice if you look at Venus with binoculars or a telescope that it's now quite a thick crescent, but its angular diameter is bigger than it was last week. And that will continue to change over the coming weeks. Uranus is between Taurus and Aries, actually, on the boundary between the two. That is at mag plus 5.7. So again, you'll need binoculars or a telescope for it. That sets at around 2 a.m. So you've, again, plenty of opportunity to look for that in the evening. Jupiter is also unmissable at mag minus 2.4. That lies in Taurus, which again is an easy constellation to find, but you can't miss Jupiter. It's really bright in that part of the sky. And that is actually visible until 4.15 a.m. So again, plenty of opportunity to look at it. We have some interesting things going on with Jupiter this week. On Tuesday, the 4th of February at 1.51 1.51 a.m., Ganymede is going to transit Jupiter and that will remain visible until Jupiter sets at 4.04. To see the actual moons orbiting the gas giants, you do need a fairly large telescope and probably a nice imaging rig. But like the thought that we even can do that with fairly modest equipment now, like when I was a child, I can't imagine ever thinking that I would have equipment that would let me see the moon of another planet crossing the disk. So, you know, it is a challenge one but definitely worth looking for 
on Thursday the 6th of February the waxing gibbous moon is going to be quite close to Jupiter and in the early hours of the morning of the 7th of February they're only going to be 4.8 degrees apart so definitely look out for that and on Saturday the 8th of February at 7.08 p.m Callisto is just three arc seconds south of Jupiter's south pole so depending whether you have a telescope that inverts or not it will either be at the bottom of the planet or it'll be at the top depending on how your optics work but it will be very very close to the south pole so it's always interesting to see them again because of the way that we're viewing Jupiter sometimes the moons are a little bit above the center of the planet sometimes below so this time rather than crossing or disappearing behind Jupiter it's going to just graze the south pole yeah the moons never well they're sometimes in a perfect line but more often than not they're a bit higgledy piggledy around the planet they are and I, I still just love looking at them like on a day-to-day -day basis and just seeing how everything has changed like how Galileo figured out the, how they were orbiting around Jupiter and when you draw that you really feel like you're connected with those moons I just love doing that so much in the sky guide each month there is a map which shows where the moons are going to be on the various nights and I always love looking at it as sort of a piece of artwork because you see these moons, it looks like they're spiralling around the planet, which I suppose in a way they are. But that always looks beautiful to me is that you can see the motion of these things working together. Okay, Mars is in Gemini at the moment. Again, very distinctive because it's got the kind of real orange colour to it. That's at mag minus 1.1 and that is visible all night long. On the Sunday, the 9th of February, Mars is really close to the southeastern limb of the 92% waxing moon. It will be at its closest at 6.50pm. But if you watch it over time during that night you will see how the distance between them is varying and it's a real example of solar system mechanics in motion because we have so many planets along the ecliptic at the moment and the moon also moves along the ecliptic we're having loads of moon and planet conjunctions and we've had some occultations as well recently but this won't be an occultation but they will be very close and the further north you are the closer mars will be to the moon Mercury reaches superior conjunction on the 9th of February. That means we can't see it. The inner planets can be in conjunction on one side of the sun or the other. And superior conjunction is when Mercury is right around the back of the sun. And whether it goes exactly around the back or not is irrelevant. It's so close to the sun that we can't observe it. But if you're wondering what inferior conjunction is versus superior, that's the difference. The inner planets either go in front of the sun or behind it. And the superior one is when Mercury Mercury is behind, it's therefore not visible from Earth. Yes, understanding the difference between superior and inferior conjunction and greatest elongation can be a bit tricky unless you've got a diagram. So I will put a link in the show notes below, which just takes you to our page about what all of those various things are. So you can take a look for yourself if you're interested. Yeah, I'm very much a visual learner, so I always appreciate diagrams like that that let me actually see it rather than reading words. But I know everybody's different. So, you know, some people prefer a written description, some prefer a picture. I'm very much in the picture category. <laughs> So one of the largest S-type asteroids in the solar system with a diameter of around about 204 kilometres is 29 Amphitrite. And that is currently moving through the sickle of Leo and it's heading towards opposition on the 12th of February. So when it's the month of opposition, these things are visible pretty much from dusk till dawn all night long. It's moved northwest from Eta Leonis, which is the star directly north of Regulus. Last week, it was around about mag plus 9.5. This week, it's going to brighten a little bit to be about 9.2. So you will still need a telescope to see that. But as we said last week, it's really fun to just watch the progression of an asteroid through a star field. Mm. So get used to the star field and then have a look at it regularly. And anything that's moved will likely be the asteroid. Now, there's so much going on on the moon this week because we're moving from waxing crescent through to waxing gibbous. And that means there are so many clair obscure effects, clair obscure meaning light and shade. And it's where the sunlight plays along the lunar surface to create these shapes and different effects that we like to name and like to observe. And at this phase, there are so many of them. And also at this time of year, the moon is really high on the ecliptic. So in the summer months, the moon barely grows 
grazes above the trees from my back garden. But at the moment, it's culminating around about 60 degrees up. So it's really high, which means it's up above atmospheric distortion. So it's a really good time to observe some of these effects. So I'm going to go through quite a few things that we can see on the moon this week. But starting on Wednesday, the 5th of February, at 8.02 a.m., the moon reaches the first quarter phase. And as the moon rises later that morning, the lunar X and V will be visible. So the X forms, it's probably the lunar X is one of the most famous Claire Obscure effects. And when sunlight hits the rims of craters Blanchinus, Lacale and Purback, it forms this kind of X shape. But what's interesting about it is when you look at it under higher magnification, you can actually see that the X is not smooth. It's full of little miniature craters and the rims of the craters are quite heavily eroded, particularly Blanchiness. That crater is about 3.9 billion years old and it's very, very worn, particularly compared to the other craters around it. So definitely have a look at that. When I imaged this with a 5X Barlow and got in super close when I did a sketch of it of the photograph I realized just how many craters there are along the x so it's definitely worth looking at that because higher magnification will reveal that detail you do sometimes forget when you're looking despite the fact that you know that they're impact craters just when you see something like that where there's just so many of them all together it really brings home just how much the moon's been pelted quite frankly <laughs> It really has. Later that night at 10.45 p.m., we've got another Claire Obscure effect called the Stars of Aristillus. And this is where the sunlight starts to catch the really complex central peak structures within Aristillus. It's located in the Northern Hemisphere, just west of Montes Caucasus, which will be casting beautiful shadows. But also in that area, if you go a little bit further north and just go west of Montes Alpes, just look for this amazing long shadow that's being cast by Montes Mons Piton. Mons Piton is kind of like an isolated peak that's currently about 2.3 kilometres tall and about 25 kilometres in diameter. When it first formed, that mountain was actually about double the height, but the whole of that basin flooded with lava at a later date, submerged a lot of the features around it. So you now just have this isolated mountain and at the right lighting angle, it's a bright white speck casting an immensely long dark shadow and it just looks so beautiful. Mm. Again, you forget with the moon that it is this place with this very high relief to it. It's very easy to sort of think of it as this flat orb with various different colours things on it. But it does have some pretty big mountains on it. You know, it's not an Olympus Mons going on, but there are big mountain ranges and these huge valleys and things. Yeah, and the shadows are interesting to watch them over time as well. If you go back to Mons Piton every couple of hours, you will see that the shadow is shortening as the sun rises over that area. And once the sun has fully risen over that area, you can barely even see Mons Piton because all that relief has gone when you've got a high lighting angle, which is why we look at the moon when it's at these phases, because you can see much more detail. It's generally considered if you want to look at a specific feature, it's best to look at it when it's near the Terminator, because then it's got the longer shadows, basically. But the Terminator being the line between the light and the dark side. Yeah, there's no Arnold Schwarzenegger coming. It's just it's, it's just the name of the shadow Terminator. As far as we know. <laughs> Um, also on Wednesday the 5th, without a telescope, you'll be able to see the moon is close to the Pleiades. So maybe you'll need binoculars depending on the glare of the moon, but it will be located quite close to the cluster, which again is always a nice photo opportunity. On Thursday, the 6th of February, we have another Claire Obscure effect called the Eyes of Clavius. Clavius is one of the biggest craters on the lunar near side, and it has quite a few smaller craters within the crater floor. As the sun rises over that area, the rims of those smaller craters catch the light first, giving you these two very eerie, like white rings that look like a pair of eyes staring out at you. So that's always a fun one to observe. So that's visible at 5 p.m. on Thursday. On Friday the 7th of February, the moon is very close to Elnath all night long. If you look at it around 11.30pm, it's about half a degree away from Elnath. Elnath being the star that's kind of shared between Auriga and Taurus. So that's definitely worth looking out for. 
Saturday the 8th of February around 6pm the jewelled handle is visible which is created when the sun rises over sinus iridum and it's I never get bored of seeing that it's just so beautiful when the sun is just rising all that area is in shadow and you have that beautiful kind of arc of white which is again heavily cratered if you look at it closely but it just catches the light so beautifully and Finally, on Sunday, the 9th of February, Cassini's Moon Maiden is visible. So once the sun has fully risen over that area, Promontorium Heraclides, you can actually see when you look at it through a telescope that makes things upside down, it looks like the side profile of a woman with long flowing hair and Cassini named it after his wife, Genevieve. That night as well, there is a Mag plus 6.95 star that is occulted by the moon. So that will disappear at 5.56 p.m. behind the non-illuminated part of the moon. So it's always fun to see a star disappear when you can't actually see what's covered it. So that's always fun. And then it will re-emerge again from the illuminated side at 6.42 p.m. So loads of stuff on the moon to look for this week. So we've just focused on that for this episode. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like there's a lot going on there. So any moon lovers out there will have a great time this week. But thank you very much for taking us through everything that we have to see. If you want to get to even more stargazing highlights, please subscribe to the Star Diary podcast and we'll be back here next week with even more. But to summarise this week again, all of the planets except for Mercury are going to be visible throughout the week after sunset and asteroid 29 Amphitrite is moving through the sickle of Leo as well. On Tuesday the 4th, Ganymede transits Jupiter in the early morning. On Wednesday the 5th of February, the Moon reaches first quarter and lies near the Pleiades. The Luna X and V are present on the rising Moon. And later, at 10.45pm, the star of Aristillus appears and Mons Piton casts a long shadow. Thursday the 6th of February, the Moon lies close to Jupiter and the eyes of Clavius are visible at 5pm. On Friday the 7th, the Moon lies very close to the star Elnath. On Saturday the 8th of February, there's a challenging daytime transit of Saturn by Titan, followed by Titan's shadow transit. Callisto lies very close to Jupiter's south pole, and the jeweled handle is visible on the moon from around 6pm onwards. Finally, on Sunday the 9th, it's a great time to see Cassini's moon maiden, which will be visible, and the moon occults a mag 6.95 star. And Mercury will also reach superior conjunction, Though, unfortunately, that will be on the other side of the sun, so we won't be able to see it. But there are lots of things that you can see, so hopefully you can get out there and do some stargazing and come back next week to get even more stargazing highlights. From all of us here, goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Thank you.